Hello, I'll be continuing work on my delivery van painting. This will be part two. In the first part, I did a black and white underpainting. And now I'm going to be applying thin paint, which will begin to give color to the values. I don't have to make any effort to stay between any lines. That's not important. I can brush color on very freely and just work back into it because the paint is thin enough that I can see through to my black and white underpainting, which is, of course, now completely dry. By the way, as near as I can tell, this uh, van, I guess it's really a truck, is a uh, Chevrolet from about 1963. And the location is Locke, California, which is a town on the Delta, which historically was occupied by Chinese immigrants. Once I've got a color on my brush, I look for other places where it might. Once I've got a color mix on my brush, I'll often look around for nearby areas where it might make sense to apply some of the same. I guess my hope is that this will help create some sort of color or unity. I'm not trying to absolutely opaquely cover my underpainting at this point as I plan to do multiple sessions where I overpaint what's below and uh, progressively create some sort of uh, variation and richness by doing so. So the end product of this first session might end up looking a little bit like a tinted black and white version of the subject, but that's okay. It's just part of a, a building process. In the brightest areas of my underpainting where things are essentially white, it often works just to lay a transparent color uh, over that white and that might be a, a golden ochre uh, which is a transparent yellow ochre made by gamblin or it could be burnt sienna it could be uh, ultramarine blue but i'll, I'll also add uh, some white paint into the mix uh, it doesn't do any harm uh, as long as I can see through to my underpainting. You can see it's easy to refine an edge even when I've gone sort of outside the boundaries with a previous pass.
I'm looking at my color reference photo, but I'm not worrying too much about color matching. I'm just uh, getting ideas from it. Uh, the hue of this paint doesn't matter so much as long as I roughly keep the same value system going. And it's a, it's a good time to experiment with, with different ideas of what hue might work in different areas. Excuse my painting costume today. It was very hot outside, over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, we were trying not to overtax our air conditioning system. It probably would have made sense to use a bigger brush here. Uh, not sure why I didn't. I guess I was switching back and forth between making large shapes and making notations about little shapes. Whenever I have any excuse to lose an edge, I try to take it. It almost never hurts the sense of reality. In fact, typically I'll put in too many edges and then be obliged at a later phase to go back and take them out again. Areas like this on the right that I'm working on uh, really can be rather flat. Uh, a little bit of my underpainting is showing through, and you get sort of a sense of windows and doorways, but I'm not going to go to a, a lot of trouble to spell those out. I'm going to hope that it gets conveyed with just a few shapes and that uh, the viewer's mind can fill in the rest.
the back end of this truck, uh, which is in shadow, still has parts of the bodywork that are facing it up towards the sky and therefore are bluish and others that are facing somewhat downward and are picking up some warm tones from the ground and from the reflected light. You see that sometimes I throw down a color almost as a guess, and that once I see it in position, I realize that the value is completely inappropriate, and I have to come back and kind of remix it right there on the canvas. In some ways, this stage is almost like uh, working a watercolor. in which I'm, I'm just uh, dropping in washes that flow across subject matter and just trying to be alert to what sort of color mixes might be interesting. I mean, I don't really have any evidence in the photograph that alizarin belongs in the darks of the shadow, but it doesn't hurt to try. I can always uh, take it out later if it's distracting. But if I put it in now and find that it creates some sort of interest, uh, it'll be a good thing to leave. I was once doing a illustration of a, an automobile for an advertising client and I went to uh, put in a wash of dark gray or black in this uh, under shadow and I accidentally had loaded up my brush with uh, dark magenta and I started it and then I realized I really had no recourse except to go ahead and put it throughout the whole shadow and then uh, and then decide what to do about it later. And I found that putting in that magenta actually perked up what eventually became close to black, but uh, the magenta showing through actually made the black more interesting.
I always think it's fun when uh, some of the most intense color in the entire composition ends up being someplace that isn't the center of interest. So I'm definitely playing on that here. I, I hope it works out in the end. I can even spill this red off into other places where it doesn't even exist in the reference photograph just as a device to kind of pull things together. We'll see what happens. I really can just smear a lot of this paint around, especially in these non-critical areas, and then just make decisions later on to partially recover edges. And that'll sort of be an ongoing process. I mean, it's easy enough to make an edge. Uh, sometimes it's hard to make a decision to let an edge go. And I'll go back and forth on these things. And I have to watch myself when it comes to automobiles because in my previous life, as an illustrator, no one would have ever complained that I put too much detail in a car uh, since the car was the product. But uh, since I've moved on from that, I have to think in other terms and make decisions about when including a door handle or a body seam or a character line might just be a distraction to the overall painting. There's not a whole lot of color differentiation in these distant buildings, and I think that's going to work fine. In fact, uh, if they were largely monochromatic back there, I don't think it would really take away from the painting. I mean, one idea that's often used in an illustration is to have the most colorful parts around the center of interest and have things go a little monochromatic as they get away from the center of interest. We'll see if I end up doing that or not.
course, it's it's always fun to start pulling bits of light out of uh, medium tones. I try to put it off as long as I can. I think most of any subject is going to be medium tones and if you make too much of a fetish about picking out little sparkly bits of light it kind of takes all the power away from all those little bits. This upper railing is, in the reference photo, a very pale green, and I what I one thing I know about myself is that I have kind of a prejudice against green. I don't know where that comes from, but uh, I have to watch myself that I don't accidentally leave it out or make a substitution, and that I give it an honest try to try to include it when it's there. Purple and rose, however, I like, so I am have the reverse problem. I'm likely to put it someplace it doesn't work and then wonder what went wrong. I'm also conscious of, I'm also conscious of the idea that I want to avoid putting two colors side by side that are completely unrelated to each other. And so for that reason, I actually spend very little time thoroughly cleaning my brush. I every color mix seems to have a little of the the last mix on it. And I think that's, as I sort of work across a canvas in a lay-in, that sort of translates into softening transitions. And I think that makes sense even in a 
optical reality in that uh, things that are near to each other are very likely bouncing colored light off of each other. I'm, I'm putting a blue on the shadow side of these white posts, which makes sense, but it's also a blue that's kind of pre-contaminated with the, with the ochres that are adjacent to it. When you have a, one object that you want to look as though it's continuing behind another, uh, as those uh, windows in the wall just did behind that post, it it's always helps to uh, you know spread around the color on your brush on on both both sides of the foreground object, so that it's clear that one is behind. Even if it's very subtle. It would be easy enough, of course, to get out a straight edge and make a horizontal mark for every board in this siding, but uh, that's the kind of look I, I certainly want to avoid.
even though some of these dark passages look almost black on my reference photo, I'm really trying to stay clear of making anything on the canvas appear too dark at this point. I'm, I'm hoping really for a painting that in the end is fairly high key. All of these dark shapes that are on the back side of the vehicle are going to, of course, create edges that define the vehicle itself. So I don't want to get carried away and make a complete dark edge around that hood. Just defining it in a couple places is enough to give the impression. These concrete piers are actually kind of interesting looking from a rendering point of view, but I don't want to get into them too much. I think most people would not consider them terribly attractive. They're not uh, old or anything. They're obviously sort of a economical repair. Every time I feel like I'm starting to put a little too much detail in an area, I'll give myself a mental kick and say, well, maybe it's time to move on to another area before we get too caught up. Sometimes it's helpful to have an inkling of what this subject is in these little background areas. Is that a lamp or is that a cord? Is that a conduit? Uh, but in a way it's kind of liberating to just paint shapes and especially in this early part pay little or no attention to what it is you're actually describing. In fact, in a lot of cases, I end up painting it in shapes and don't realize until much later what it was being depicted. Sometimes that, 
that's actually the best result. Well, the tarmac may not be the most interesting part of this picture, but it has a value. I don't want it to be too light. I'm actually going to cheat it for now a little dark at, darker than it is in my reference. And I'm going to try to inject some color, although being tarmac, I don't expect it to have a lot of color. But if anything, it seems kind of purplish or blue purplish. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try that for a start, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to go for any sort of solid paint. In the end, I'll probably end up with a, a patchwork of, of different color marks that from a distance sort of neutralize each other out. And it's always worth remembering that areas like this pretty much are in service to the center of interest. So before the, the painting is done, I will have decided if this ground is, is helping to contain the composition and lead your eye back to the car and the you know the other more interesting parts or if it's become a distra distraction and then I need to tone it down but for now I'm just putting in sort of these place keepers so that I can end this session having put some kind of color all over the canvas It can be real easy to fall in love with some of these uh, almost accidental marks. And uh, sometimes it's okay to keep them around for a while, but then in the end, you'll have to make decisions about whether they're really serving the picture or not. But it, it's fun to make them anyway, even if they're kind of just gestures. Uh, you know, maybe something good will happen with them, maybe not. It doesn't hurt to try. In the back of my mind, I think I know that I want this lower left corner to be kind of a container and uh, 
keep the eye on the composition. So I'm, I'm prob I was probably overemphasizing its darkness for now. The same is true of this upper left. I don't want the viewer's eye to fall out of the upper left, but I also don't want it so dark up in that corner that uh, people pay it too much attention. And just as a matter of standard practice, I, I suppose I'm expecting that this far background will end up being cooler than the foreground and that that always seems to work out fine. Actually, another way to approach this whole area would have been to pretty much wash over the entire area with some sort of pale blue and then work back into it. Uh, that probably would have worked pretty well. Instead, I seem to be going about it piecemeal. Generally speaking, I think best practice is to uh, use a big brush for as long as you can and uh, only very deliberately put a small brush in your hand and then only for good reason. My other dilemma here, which I recognized at the very beginning looking at my reference, was that it would be very easy to get bogged down uh, putting these uh, upright, what do you call them, balusters in the railing. Uh, and I, I made a decision very early that I would only indicate them and that I wouldn't try to count them or uh, put them in perspective carefully or anything that I would just uh, try to make it work with as few shapes as I could. But I won't be surprised if I go back and forth on that a lot before I arrive at a, a balance I can live with. But I know that I, I really don't want very much attention on that railing up there. It would only be a distraction.
lot of what I'm putting in here will probably be virtually obliterated in the end, but it doesn't hurt to play around a little bit. It might end up just providing a slight color variation underneath what is almost a monochromatic wash in the end. And that sort of layering effect is pretty difficult to achieve with any kind of direct painting method, uh, at least for me. It's, it's easier for me to just to achieve that kind of ambiguity and variety by just painting and repainting, making the same decisions over and over again. I know here I saw an intense blue in my reference, and even though it's kind of against my nature, once it's on my brush, I, I go around and give it a try. It may not survive in the end, but uh, it, on the other hand, it may end up being a very nice little accent. about the most satisfying thing is to put back in bright shapes again because that's when things start to pop but this round will just be one of many occasions to do this I will probably wash over these lights again after they're dry and have another go at that and in the process I'll get sort of a hierarchy of highlights in which some are very bright and some are sort of just brightish. And although I started this painting like one might a watercolor, I didn't do any planning about where to leave the white of paper. I just painted through everything. And this is where, you know, the beauty of a, of a medium that can be made opaque comes through. Now I get to make a whole other set of decisions about where to recover highlights and, and where not to. And even if I overdo it, I can knock them back down again. I'd been saving these little bright spots on the siding of the building for the end because I knew it would be fun. I like that they're so bright but at the same time they're not actually on the center of interest but that their placement behind the center of interest is going to help define its edge. In a way, I feel like it's my mimicking of what a camera does, which is to objectively record bright light, even when it's not exactly where I expected it to be, 
and it's not as obvious as a highlight on the center of interest. And here I am, probably already overdoing it. But it's fun, and next pass, I'll make some harder decisions about what to leave in and what to leave out. When I'm going after these light shapes, I, I try not to fill them all in with exactly the same color or value. And I, I sometimes think of uh, the placement of the light shapes along an axis like this as kind of a code in which I, it's almost as though I was typing out some sort of Morris code where I try to make interesting intervals between the the light shapes and not just block the entire thing in. And then knowing that I'm going to be going over that area and rediscovering it over and over again should theoretically make it uh, more interesting. I'm really just messing around here and uh, there's already an alarm going off in my head that I see need to stop mucking around and leave off for the day. And that this needs to dry and then I'll, uh, I'll come back it, to it again with another color session with fresh eyes and... Uh, more courage and not be afraid to try new things and uh, risk some of the cute little things I've done here where I'm 
am doing here. But knowing also that trying new things means giving up an old thing. So trying a new mark may be giving up on an old mark or sacrificing it. I can't avoid putting this blue down because it, it really is in the reference and it's not something I can just discount, but I am going to be careful here about where I put it. I guess this is repeating back, but you get the idea. White things are a challenge to paint because, well, they're white everywhere. And so a lot of the work is going over and over it until everything looks white, but not very little of it is actually white, and that you've created a lot of subtle halftones. Even on the reference, there's an interesting place just in front of the wheel where I'm working where the white, uh, the white side of the truck, the lower body panel, is precisely the same value as the ground. And I, I noticed that right off, and I also knew it was going to be important to not create an edge there. in that little triangle just in front of the rear wheel. And some things at this point I, I may put in an, as pure white, uh, maybe with slightly thicker paint, uh, not knowing that they're not going to be white in the end, but as a uh, placeholder uh, that I can uh, glaze over in subsequent sessions. Often the last thing I do before I quit for the day is uh, turn down the the uh, light and darkness on my reference and remind myself of where exactly the very, very brightest spots are and then just restate them again in white paint in preparation for the next session. Well, that's it for this session. This is going to dry, and then I'm going to come back in part three and repaint the whole thing. 
See you then.